Welcome to Bed Crime Stories Podcast. I'm your host, T. Good day, bed crimers. I hope life in your neck of the woods is going well. Happy holidays to you. I wish you all a peaceful holiday season surrounded by loving family members and friends. To anyone new, welcome to the channel. Thanks for checking it out. Hey, if after listening to and watching this video, you find that you maybe learned something or you enjoyed the content, please do me a favor and hit the like button and please consider subscribing. And now without further ado, let's dig in. Inan Harsh, aka Chef Dizzy, the 30-year-old neighbor of the slain students in Moscow, Idaho, recently appeared on the Hidden True Crime podcast with host Lauren Mathias. He also turned up on another channel called Unresolved Crimes, where he spent about 15 minutes chatting with the host. Inan Harsh first turned up on the scene because of some comments he made to a reporter from the Idaho Statesman newspaper, who happened to be in the neighborhood where the slain student's rental home is located. Harsh, who lives in the brick and yellow apartment complex right next door to the crime scene, said then, when he was taking out his garbage, he ran into the reporter. That's when Harsh announced that he may have heard a scream around 4 a.m. on November 13th, 2022, the day of the murders. This was a shocking thing to hear three and a half weeks after the crime from a guy who'd made a post on social media two days after the murders saying that there were no screams, no evidence, and no trace. When you have a neighbor who lives right next door to the crime scene show up in the news talking about a possible scream three and a half weeks after the fact, and then you discover that he said something completely different two days after the crime, it gets everyone's attention and it casts suspicion on said neighbor. During his interview on unresolved crime, which I'll leave a link to in the description, Harsh told the host that he thinks it's possible the crime could have been committed by someone who follows the tenets of a local Moscow church that has been called cult-like. The controversial Christ Church was founded in Moscow back in the 1990s, and it appears that over time this church has become increasingly conservative, and its grip and even control over Moscow has become tighter and tighter. An article that was published on November 2nd of 2021 on The Guardian's website says that experts who studied the Moscow church estimate that the size of its congregation and its offshoot churches are about 2,000, a little under 10% of the town's total population. The church has a stated goal to make Moscow a Christian town. Per the 2021 Guardian article, which was written and published when COVID was still at the forefront of the news, and I quote, church figures had browbeaten elected officials over COVID restrictions, built powerful institutions in parallel to secular government, harassed perceived opponents, and accumulated land and businesses in Moscow in pursuit of a long-term goal of transforming America into a nation ruled according to its own ultra-conservative moral precepts. In another article about Christ's Church, written by Sarah Stancorb and published on Vice.com on September 28th of 2021, Moscow's in-town farmer's market was described as being populated by friendly, well-dressed Kirkers, which is local shorthand for members of Mother Kirk, the nickname for Christ Church. The article said that Christ Church is affiliated with institutions throughout Moscow's main street and business district, including the K-12 Logos School, a publishing house called Canon Press, an unaccredited pastoral ministry program named Greyfriars Hall, and a private college called New St. Andrews. It sounds like anyone living in Moscow, including the students who show up there for part of the year, is aware of Christ Church. One of the biggest criticisms of this ultra-conservative church are its misogynistic views, its belief that women should be controlled by their husbands. According to Stan Korb's article, 
the church's controversial pastor, Douglas Wilson, preaches that wives need to be led with a firm hand, end quote. Wilson has also written that men conquer and women surrender. One woman who calls herself a survivor of this church called it a patriarchal cult in which women must submit or face discipline at home and at church. For this article, Vice interviewed 12 former and current church members and Logos students and reviewed court and medical documents, church correspondence, and business filings. Ex-church members describe a punitive community in which women are told they must defer to church leaders and cannot say no to their husbands. Men are taught to strictly control their homes and those who speak out can be isolated and harassed. What I find interesting is that this ultra-conservative church is smack in the middle of a college town. In general, college towns tend to be on the liberal side, and Moscow's University of Idaho is big into Greek life, where students who are interested can apply to fraternities and sororities. And by the way, those applications come with a price. You have to pay to apply to these fraternities and sororities. And there's also an annual charge for most of them. And sometimes they can end up costing around $1,000 to apply and upwards of 3000 to pay the annual fees. Now, those are on the high side. Some are as low as maybe $100 to apply. And while these social organizations are designed to foster academic community service and social initiatives, as well as the tenets of friendship, leadership, scholarship, and philanthropy, they have also been known to cultivate a party culture. It is not uncommon for alcohol to be abused at some of these parties. Inan Harsh also describes how loud the houses on Greek Row can be when the students are socializing on the weekends. Harsh said it's not uncommon to hear screams on any given Saturday. It makes me wonder how Christ Church and its faithful followers view the university, its many fraternity and sorority houses, and their loud, sometimes raucous parties. Some of the female students who lived at the crime scene on King Road were in sororities, and their residence was known as a party house. How does the Christ Church regard the partying that goes on along Greek Road? Could someone who follows this church's ultra-conservative beliefs have noticed the attractive females living at 1122 King Road? And could this violent act have been done as a punishment, maybe, for their partying ways, as a way to make an example out of them as to what happens when you live a certain way or in retaliation for some perceived or stated rejection by someone who belongs to that church. We've also heard about these incels or involuntary celibates who are part of an online community of young men who consider themselves unable to attract women sexually and who are typically associated with views that are hostile toward women and men as well who are sexually active. Could there be an incel living in or near Moscow who decided to act out? Could this incel be attached to this church in some way? Someone who follows this church's beliefs about women. By the way, I'm not saying this vicious crime was sanctioned by Christ Church or carried out by a churchgoer, but I'm speculating if there could be some sort of connection. Is there someone who frowns upon young female students drinking alcohol, hosting loud parties, wearing short dresses, enjoying their beauty? Note that I'm not saying in any way that these young women were doing anything wrong or that their behavior is in any way such that they deserved this. No way. And people should dress however they want to. And it's no invitation to others to look at them and lust after them. College is supposed to be a time to socialize and have fun. And what females wear are their business. And it should not be viewed by men as an open invitation to stare at them, 
with lascivious intent or to think that they are somehow leading men on. But as we're now past the one month mark and in the absence of any named suspects, I think it's at least worth considering. This may not be the most likely scenario, but it could be a possibility. And by the way, some Christchurch members are not without criminal past. In May of 2022, Alex R. Lloyd, a deacon at the church, was indicted by federal authorities for possession of child P. The Osco Police Department discovered that Lloyd possessed child SA images on his iPhone from March of 2021 up until January of 2022. One of those images involved a prepubescent minor, which means someone not yet 12 years of age. At the time that happened, church pastor Doug Wilson said he'd received Lloyd's resignation, and as of May 2022, he said he had started the process of removing Lloyd from office as a deacon. And that's not the first time leaders of Christ's church have had run-ins with the law. In 2001, Pastor Doug Wilson presided over the wedding of a convicted child essayer, a man named Stephen Sittler. Wilson later told another church member that Sittler was very welcome in their congregation. Next, we have Jamin White, a former student at Greyfriars Hall, the church's pastoral training program. White was convicted of essaying a teen girl when he was in his 20s. So we have an ultra-conservative church in Moscow that has a lot of influence due to its land possessions and businesses in town, and this church preaches that women are to be kept in check by their husbands and by the church. I think this is something that has to be considered, especially as we have a perpetrator who didn't just do in one person, he did in four young people with a sharp-edged object in a cold and calculated attack that appears to have been planned to some extent. We likely aren't just dealing with an angry ex-boyfriend. It takes more than that to go on a rampage like this. This is really the stuff of serialists. More and more, that's what I'm thinking. Until the next time on Bed Crime Stories, do me a favor. If you enjoyed this, hit that like button. Subscribe if you're not yet subscribed. Leave me a comment and consider a membership if you want to support the work I do.